So now let's talk about uh, understanding the mechanics of the school system. Because at one point or another, most at one point or another, most families will have that uh, have to understand the school system. But dealing with any system, you know, there's a lot of you know, if you understand system, yeah, system analysis. That's what we're going to talk about um, today. So we're also talking about the school system in the context of understanding the mechanics of it, its procedures, its policy, and also the role of people. Because you know, you can talk about policy and procedures, but there's always the human beings in there that either can make things much better or much worse. And so what we're trying to do is to see how can we help those human beings in the system make decisions that work uh, for children with exceptionalities. So policy is one of the ways that a government ministry achieves the government's goals and objectives, right? So that's policy in the sort of system, government system. Policy can be formal or informal. Um, and it can be derived from legislation like the School Act. So in British Columbia, there's something called the School Act. And that's a very powerful piece of legislation. No school district should be doing things in contravention of the School Act, right? That's a big no-no. But there's a lot of gray areas. And sometimes that's where families have to get active in pushing, pushing back, which means you've kind of got to know the policies, right? Policies can be acted through, enacted through various instruments. And it can be laws. It can be fines. It can be contracts. It can be partnerships. There's lots of stuff that goes on. But the important thing I want to bring to your attention now is the language of policy. And you'll, you'll notice up on the screen that there are certain words that are in red, and it's the must. So when a, when a school district, when a, the uh, policy of British Columbia, the School Act, uh, which this is drawn from, um, says a board must make available an educational program to all persons of school age who enroll in the school district. This is really important. So if your child is being told that they can only, or you're being told that your child can only go to school two hours a day, you have a case there for saying, well, um, I don't think that meets the school acts requirements, right? Um, then there are the shoulds, right? They're not nearly as strong as the must. And the shoulds uh, are ideal, but not required. So the shoulds include that the specialist teachers working with children with ASD should have or acquire skills and training in behavior management and skill development. Yet many of us have had the situation of our child going into a school program, um, even a specialized program, just for kids with special needs, where there is, the teacher uh, has been hired and they don't have this background. So, Sometimes that's because of seniority issues within the union, that the person who has the most seniority for this job is not the person who has the qualifications. I think that that is an issue of, of, for advocacy, that um, in order for our children to do well, they're complex, regardless of the special need. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a special need. Um, that you, know, you can advocate with the school district to look at the, how they hire and fill positions is it just done on the basis of seniority? Or what is the training that someone needs to have in order to be hired to work with children with special needs? And that also applies for, for teaching assistants as well. This is a big issue for us. And it's been a big issue for over 20 years of, fan, of children going to school with a significant um, diagnosis like autism and where the school team hasn't got the education or training that they require. Other places you could advocate on this is with the universities that train our teachers, because they train teachers who are not required to take a course in special needs when they, by the time they've graduated. To me, that's an advocacy issue. Sure. So, and the other question I've just been asked is, what about teaching assistants? And it's the same thing: is that you have to? It's a question for parental advocacy to say, you know. It's very difficult for my child to do well if he hasn't got a trained aide to work with him. 
um, <clears throat> or to work with a group of children, you know, because it's not necessarily that every child requires a one-to-one aid, but that one-to-one aid should have some background. And in British Columbia, they are supposed to have um, at least some level of training, um, and most do, but often it's a, it's a sort of, you know, the more training, the better sort of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a question of does the person who's being hired to work with children have the training that they require? Um, and in British Columbia and throughout most of Canada, I think it's not been, but particularly in BC, there hasn't been a lot of attention put to um, what takes precedent. The need of the person with special needs to have accommodation, which requires someone with specialized knowledge and training, or the need of an employee to keep their job based on seniority. Now, most parents have a very strong view that it's the former rather than the latter. But these are things that um, will ha probably be dealt with in the, in the courts eventually. But it's something that families need to think about because it is an advocacy issue. And it's one that you can discuss with the parents in your community around how you like to deal with that with your school district. So that's the difference between must and should. Um, and the may says that the board may provide all or part, so this is the third bullet, <clears throat> of an educational program by means of distributed learning. Now that means the school district, you know, can have, that means you can have online educational programs. And a lot of our families have found those to be quite helpful. There is some one-to-one -one support, but it's not very high. It wouldn't have worked for my son, who needed a lot of support. Um, and I, I would never have been very good at homeschooling. However, some families find that a very, it's a very useful thing for them. And if you don't know about distributed learning, call us at ACT, and Jeff Hoffman will find out all about it for you. Um, then th here's another important um, issue around policy that uh, families feel very strongly about. And this is an excerpt from the Special Education Services, a manual of policies, procedures, and guidelines. And later you'll see a link to that. You can read it. You can be sure that very few school administrators have read it. So if you read it and try and understand it, it's a very helpful thing for you to understand what the policy should be. And to be fair, you know, they're dealing with a lot of very diverse children, very difficult circumstances. So if you can point to them where in policy it actually says this is what they should be doing and do it very politely, and, you know, I just would like to share with you this information. You know, could we discuss what the implications are for little Jimmy? That's very helpful, right? They should be very grateful. So the guidelines say that in order, you know, to decide where a child is placed, and you know, families feel very passionately that their child should be either in the um, regular classroom or that they should be uh, in a specialized placement. We as families have, you know, we, we are very, we know our children, we know what is going to meet their needs. Um, and it's difficult sometimes to uh, communicate those needs. So when I talked about the profile and learning about your child, those are all important um, um, things that you need to do in order to make your case. But what the manual says is that, and this is the school you know, Ministry of Education's manual, not ACT's manual, that a school board must ensure that a principal offers to consult with a parent or a child of a child who has special needs regarding this child's placement in an educational program. The school board must provide a student who has special needs with an educational program in a classroom where the student is integrated with other students who do not have special needs unless the educational needs of the ch student with special needs or other students indicate that the program should be provided otherwise. It doesn't say anywhere here, you're, but that the, it's okay for a child with special needs only to go to school one hour or two hours uh, a day. I think the implication is clear that the child should be going to school somewhere. However, you know, I want just to, to, most of us would like to see our children included as much as possible with typical children in the regular classroom. I had one of those childs, children who's very, he's very anxious, he's still very anxious. 
And it was very difficult for him to be in a very busy classroom for the full day. So we were fine with him having some quiet time. And we, could, we took data, and we could see that when he had part of the day out of the classroom, he actually did better. It wasn't that he didn't like to be with the other children. He did. But it made him very anxious, the level of noise and busyness and everything else. You know, was Because noise that Adam makes is fine. Noise that other children make is not fine. Right? So anyway. Um, so, you know, you do have to look at not the ideology that you endorse. Like for me, it would have been great to include Adam all the time with his peers. I had to look at what his needs were. And that's what I say to, you know, when parents get very passionate about they have to be included in everything all the time, I say, that's the goal. And how are we going to help that child? Um, what do they need in terms of behavior support? Maybe they need medication for anxiety. You know, maybe we should be looking at a classroom that has carpets in it to bring down the noise levels. You know, whatever it takes. But just to be clear that um, as parents, we get very passionate about a particular uh, ideology of autism or school education, whatever. Take the time to think about your child's needs. And be careful about saying to other parents what you think their child you know, what should work for their child, because you're not living with their child. And one of the things that I've learned, some humility, I've learned many things to be humble about, is I'm not walking in the shoes of this parent, and I do not know exactly what the dynamics are for that child. So I'm very, now, you know, uh, I was quite different, say, 20 years ago, but I have learned some maturity on that front. Um, and I just think, you know, as parents, particularly if you're living in small communities, if you're telling other parents what they should be doing, you will really irritate them. <laughs> and they, you know, when you need their help in advocating for a bigger issue that involves all of you, it's harder you know, to make those. So be respectful um, of their per different perspectives. And you know, if you're concerned because you know, this is a parent that's totally embraced you know, vitamin C as a therapy for autism and you're concerned, know that you need to keep up those lines of communication with them so that when they're ready for something else, they'll come to you as a friend, you know, as a member of their community, um, and won't feel that you've been you know, judging them or being dismissive of them, right? And the smaller your community is, the more important that message is. So when we talked about um, you know, the school board um, must uh, consult with the parent. That comes back to that question again. Remember about meaningful consultation? That doesn't mean you get a letter home the first week of September saying, we've decided to put your child in such and such a classroom. Thank you, right? That's not meaningful consultation. So it may be that, that you agree that that's the best classroom, and you had a discussion with that in June, and you know that that's, that's, a, good, um, that's a good placement for your child. But you can always say, I'm sorry, but I have concerns about this. We need, could we have a meeting, please? I want to, I want to discuss this. And you, know, you could you know, make it clear that it's urgent. Uh, one year when things did not go very well for my son, and I couldn't get a meeting with the administrator in the school district, uh, I finally said, well, I know you're very busy. Um, I'll be sitting in your reception area until you have time to discuss this issue, because it's really important for my, hun for my son's health and safety. Um, but you have to do that with restraint. You don't use something like that every week, and you don't do it for small stuff, right? It's got to be really major. So you have to, you know, this issue of picking your battles, it's very important. Um, so again, you know, in that manual, you'll see that it says the emphasis on educating children or students with special needs in neighborhood school classrooms, which is the ideal in the province of British Columbia, and which we can advocate for that ideal, right? Doesn't mean that we cannot use resource rooms, which are, you know, resource rooms means a room, a classroom, particularly for kids with special needs. Self-contained classes, community-based programs, or specialized settings. They can be placed in settings other than a neighborhood school classroom. But your role as a parent advocate is, is that the right place for my son? 
is it being done simply because there's no more money for an aide somewhere else or, you know, such a program that would fit him isn't available? So you have to think, is this going to work for my child? Do, am I being meaningfully consulted? What would work better? How can I, um, yeah. how can I advocate for them in a respectful but firm way within the school district? And because it says here, the child should be put into a resource room or not into the general classroom only when all reasonable efforts to integrate the student have not been successful. So often the decision is made without actually coming up with any alternatives. So those are, um, those are where a parent can engage. And at the end of the day, if you're, you know, if you've talked to the principal and we'll talk about this a little bit longer, and you haven't been successful at the level of the school, you can go to the school district and have your concerns met. And you'll see that there are other, beyond that, there are other avenues as well. <laughs>